Forging Honor podcast. I'm Jonathan George. And I'm Benjamin Jones. Here at The Forge, we explore what it means to live as Christian men. Along the way, we'll be doing weekly challenges to build character through action. We are by no means experts, just two young Christian men trying to make sense of a wild world. That's right. We're doing our best to learn and hope you'll join us on the journey. And if you want to get directly involved, go to forginghonor.com to find information on how to join our community. This is Episode 5, A Pantheon of Heroes and Digital Natives in Exile. All right, time to do a challenge wrap up. So we get to talk about heroes. Uh, This last episode's challenge um, was an exploration using our honor journal uh, of our heroes, whether they're from childhood or they are people that influence us now. Um, And this this episode uh, was kind of Banjo's brainchild. So I'm going to give the numbers and then hand it over to him. Um, I, I completed eight out of the... That, that can't be right. I don't remember doing eight days. Maybe it was just seven. <laughs> uh, seven of the ten days, and then I have banjo at um, ten for ten. Although, did you did you mark the last day? Uh, I didn't. I did not mark the last day. Oh, then that's a nine for ten. That's a nine for ten. Yeah, ah. I I I flew. I I was right there. I was right on the edge. And then uh, yesterday, I I substitute taught first grade, uh, and I, that was that just I. My legs left me. My legs were... You, you were so close. So close. I was so close. Well, uh, at any rate, this I like the, the journal challenges um, partially because they are, they are... They can be more achievable sometimes. You know, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Um, that said, like even if, even if you hit 10 for 10, like how much do you get out of it? So that's, that's partially what this discussion is about. Um, so Banjo, kick us off here. Yeah, and I think we've been talking about, JJ, just how much we enjoy the reflective element of the journal. Um, And I think that's been a surprising element to it of how much time do we spend reflecting on what's in our minds on a day-to-day basis um, if we're not journaling. Right. I think I was was talking with uh, some fifth graders yesterday and, and just talking to them about the way that our digital world works, I think we'll probably talk about this maybe later. So maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but um, one of the way our digital, one of the way our digital worlds work is just to suck us into the void uh, and to keep us there and not really to, to think about it. Um, I'll share a few of my heroes. Uh, There was a long list that I made very long and probably not all that helpful (laughs) to just read through all of them. So I'll just pick out a couple um, I, well, of course my dad, um, got to say that right up front. Um, if you haven't read the essay, uh, I wrote on, uh, the website, uh, you should check it out. Um, uh, that, that covers a lot of my thoughts there on that. But, um, also, uh, Tim Tebow, uh, has been a, uh, an idol of mine for a long time. Um, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Henry V, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, and Aaron Sorkin. Uh, would all I think be um, some pretty who, major ones? You're gonna need to tell me about that last one. Who, who's Aaron? Oh Sorkin. yes, Aaron. Aaron Sorkin is. Uh, he's my favorite writer um, of uh, television and movies. So he wrote The West Wing, which is one of my favorite shows. Um, he wrote A Few Good Men. Uh, it's another one of his uh, more popular ones. He wrote The Social Network. Um, he's known for his just insanely snappy dialogue uh and uh, i've i just am i'm enamored by the way that he writes um and the characters that he creates so um he's he's pretty much top of the list in terms of the writers that i wish i was um how about you jj what what kind of stuff what kind of heroes did you come up with i i kind of gave a, a short version of the list um at the last episode but of course uh jr Tolkien. for anyone that knows me he's he's my favorite author, um, been in love with him as a, as an author and just as a creator of worlds since I, I, I grew up listening to an audiobook of the Hobbit. And then my mom read, uh, Lord of the Rings aloud to, to me and my sister when I was, I don't know, I think 10 or 11 or so. At any rate, um, that was just the perfect age for the, the fantasy genre. 
and just the the sheer vastness of the world that that he created that Tolkien created was it, it I was pretty enamored with it um then uh, I I listed John Paul Jones uh last time as well and he he was uh, a naval officer for uh the for the Americans during the time of uh just the revolutionary war period or war for independence as I generally call it and then um, as well as uh, 1812, fought several major naval battles. Um, he was he was a rough man, um, but a, a hero in terms of just building the U.S. Navy. As the, he he really got it got it going. He was one a visionary. Um, and then uh, Brett McKay, who is the author and podcast host of The Art of Manliness, uh, and he is I mean his his podcast has in many ways inspired this one uh he ends every every episode well he he didn't used to now he ends every episode with um take what you've or take what you've learned into action um so he he gives a call to men to take everything that he that they've heard in each episode and and go do it and i think that's our attempt to follow through on that a little bit um yeah i think our mind I think one of our very first conversations we ever had, JJ, was about art of manliness and, and yes. the things that we were learning on that. So uh, many thanks to Brett McKay and to the art of manliness. And I really love that. He gives a lot of great bite-sized chunks into various authors and articles and ideas. Um, and and so, yes, that, that's been a huge impact for me. And then um, I, someone that came to mind in my journaling uh, was a high school cross-country coach who – Uh, He really had an impact on me, especially in high school. I unfortunately have not really kept up with him since, uh, um, but I, I, you know, actually that that's false. I I forgot. I, I would text him all my uh, PRs in college. And so, and I let him know when I got married and had a kid and everything. So I don't know. I I just send him an update every now and again, but I don't, I don't go out and have long conversations. Um, And so I, I had to, delve into and explore a little bit as to why he made an impact in my life. And then I'll finish up this list uh, with, with my father uh, as being last on the list <laughs> rather than the first, but they say save the best for last. Um, and I think that's some, that's an area I, I'd like to talk about. Why is it that, you know, some people it's their father would be the last person they would ever consider a hero. Uh, and then we have our fathers are on these, on these lists that we've created and I, I think about my father every day, just the the types of decisions he might make. And then, um, you know, what would he think about what I'm doing? I'm kind of on a similar note I, I, as my father, but a couple of other uh, men about his age that have had an impact in my life. There's there's a couple of elders in my church who um, I fall into some of the same category, a father figure. And, and some of them I see more often than my own father. So... They, they kind of stand in for that a little bit. I, I don't know. That's important to me. So I, I, I've had to delve into that relationship because that's different than, say, an inspiration um, like the author you're talking about or like Tolkien or, or John Paul Jones, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, a good question. And, and like, uh, worth noting that um, I think more and more often the, the place of fathers is – it, it, it's not this. It's not the same. I mean, um, if you look at um, some of the some of the statistical research around um, some of the confusion around uh, what does it mean to be a man? Uh, there's a great uh, great book. Uh, an author, Richard Reeves, has written a book called uh, "Of Boys and Men." Um, he's got some good YouTube videos as well, um, and he talks about the declining role of uh, fathers uh, in in their children's lives. Um, and that uh, the the declining presence of fathers has an outsized effect on boys in particular. Um, so uh, young boys are uh, more affected by uh, the absence of a father in a family than um, a young girl would be. Um, so I think that kind of uh, highlights the importance of that that father aspect like we're we're kind of looking for that father figure um and not everybody has one and i think jj you and i are particularly blessed in the fathers that we've had and also in the wealth of resources in the in our churches and in our communities 
who have had really admirable father figures. Um, and, and I think it's worth noting that not everybody has that. Um, and how do you, like, one thing I think we have to figure out is how do we seek those kinds of people out? How do we promote those kinds of, um, admirable men around us who we can kind of point to and look to and say, you know, this is, uh, this is a good thing to be, be that, you know? Um, so maybe, maybe one question to, to narrow the discussion a little bit, what, when, when you were looking through your, your heroes, what were some of the things that you identify as like, okay, this makes this person uh, a hero. What were some of the points of influence that made right. these people your heroes? Yes. The, the, the common connector for each of them. Um, well, some of them of course are very well known and others not at all. I, th I think then it, it, it can't, it can't simply be wow, they were extremely successful in their field. Although all of these men have been successful in their field in some way. Um, I think it's more, th there's a, there's a, dis there's a humility on display. And yet at the same time, I, I don't know if self-assurance is the right word. I use that in my journaling, but maybe more of a, a confidence and a, and a persistence and a willingness to go do the next thing. And, and whether or not, you know, if my father listens to this, he might push back and say, well, I don't know. I never got it. You know, he, he's always very, uh, he, he doesn't, he doesn't like to advertise himself, but he's always, he's always trying to do the next thing for the family. Um, and he, so he, he's a musician and a guitarist and I think he's been very successful in his field. And he would say, Oh, there's a million guitarists better than me. And, you know, he's not playing on a, on the world stage, but like that, that, that doesn't make a success. He's been persistent and he's made a living for his family doing that. And now as a pastor, um, he's, he's caring for others in that as well. So he's, he's a musician slash pastor, um, kind of an interesting, interesting combination of roles at any rate. Um, but he, he's got the humility as well to continue learning. And the same goes for someone like Tolkien, who you read his letters and I was rereading some of his letters to, uh, his sons recently. And, and just, it hit me that while he's giving his sons advice and he's trying to give them the best advice he can as, as young men, at the same time, he recognizes that, or he's able to, he's able to say things and look back at his past mistakes and use the, use those mistakes and what he learned from them as examples. It's not like he, he had it figured out from birth, right? The same goes for his writing. The number of revisions he had to make to yeah. his, anything he wrote in order to get it to its final product. And even then he was still wanting to make revisions because he knew it wasn't quite right, but he was willing to get it out there as well. It's like he, he, you can get caught in the trap of constant, constant revision, constantly trying to get something exactly right. Or, you throw everything out there. And the first thing that, that you throw out there, you just go ahead and go for it, but then it's awful. And it's, it's, I think these men kind of figure out that balance. I, I don't know. Does, does that make sense? That combination of, of, I don't like the word self-assurance because that, that I, I don't know. I want to find a better word for it, but that combination of self-assurance and humility. Yeah. Maybe a, uh, a, a, a confident self-reliance combined with, uh, this humility. I like, I like yeah. that, um, that, that idea of like teachability and that humility of there's, there's always something to learn from this scenario. I, I think, I think you talked about John Paul Jones and his, um, maybe this was uh, at a different point where we were talking separately, but, um, you talked about his ability to just learn from failure and turn around, um, and, and use whatever he learned in the battle, you know, to get the next victory. I thought that was pretty remarkable. Um, because we, I mean, we live in such a, a succeed on the first try kind of culture and society that the idea of learning from failure is a little bit foreign. I watched this great documentary on Netflix called Losers. Um, that was all of these people who like lost their big moment fight or their big moment uh, competition. And they ended up like changing the sport or changing the world through their loss. It was really incredible, definitely worth a watch. So that, that's interesting because you mentioned the our world is not familiar with that, but there's this whole concept and in Silicon Valley that I'm only aware of because I like to keep up with technology stuff of just 
they they'll you know the whole have you heard failing forward like that phrase failing yeah forward? yeah yeah so that, that's a phrase but you hear it in silicon valley a lot more and they will literally have like failure parties so they'll do a startup they'll raise millions of dollars they lose it all and then they throw a big party celebrating their failure and really and, and it comes out of an attempt to it comes out of an attempt to say, look at us, we're learning, we're okay with the failure that we that we have, but we're learning moving forward. But it's almost like they've started to celebrate the mistakes over the successes sometimes. Interesting. Um, now, I, I don't really know enough about Silicon Valley culture. I live in Tennessee, not Silicon Valley. <laughs> to really make a critique on that, I just remember reading about that at one point and thinking, huh, that's, that's really interesting because, you know, if I'm hit with some kind of failure, I'm going to sit and go, okay, well, that wasn't great. That doesn't feel good. What can yeah. I do about this? Right, you know, and it's not. Let's go celebrate this amazing failure I just had. Yeah, and and maybe maybe my attitude about that is kind of. I mean, you can get something out of out of that from the heroes that I admire, at least historically. I mean, I think a lot about, um, like, a lot of my heroes are driven by um, sort of a. a a guilt or a or a past pressure. So Henry V, yeah, historically in the play, um, he is he's driven to attack France, essentially in order to make up for his father's sin, because his father is the one who um, killed the previous monarch in order to take the throne, and Henry is trying to make up for that transgression by going to get land for the church, essentially. Uh, so he's driven by guilt. So so fix a war by having another war. Let's go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Well, you know, come see, come stop. But uh, it was the French. Um, so he's driven by that. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> JJ just got the joke. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm over here <laughs> laughing. And Banjo is forced to watch me laugh in silence as he's trying to make a very serious point. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Spider-Man, obviously one of my heroes. Uh, I've talked about him before, but he, he's obviously driven by the, um, by the death of his Uncle Ben, which now I'm an Uncle Ben, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. You're fact. an Uncle Ben. That's right, yes. Benjamin. Oh, that's, that's so cool. I'm, so I'm hoping my little nieces turn into little spider girls one day. <sighs> Someday if... after you get shot in front of them. <laughs> and, you know. But it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Um, and then like Teddy it's Roosevelt. For a noble cause. Yes, yeah, for a noble cause. For heroes. That's what we do for our heroes. Um, and then and Teddy Roosevelt and Alexander Hamilton are both these political figures who are are driven by this thing that they can't I mean, I don't know if they can even define, but they're they they feel the chip on their shoulder. I mean, Hamilton comes from you know, comes from the Caribbean basically, is a, is born in poverty. Um, can never be president. The whole clause in the Constitution about um, a president must be uh, a natural born citizen of the United the United States is pretty much just in there initially to block Hamilton from becoming president. Um, ah, the pettiness. Ah, the pettiness. But uh, the result of that is that he uh, creates the National Bank. He's writing prolifically. Um, Teddy Roosevelt uh, is born with asthma. Uh, riddled with disease and his father tells him look you can uh you gotta you gotta make the most of this basically uh see what you can do and turns himself into uh maybe one of the most energetic and uh just kind of wilderness men we've ever seen at least in the presidency um and so i'm struck by these these characters who kind of um maybe had this one mistake on their ledger or maybe had this one flaw on their, on their side and decide, well, I got to do everything that I can to outpace this one thing. Um, and I say that as not necessarily as like, this is what makes a hero. I say, this is, this is more about myself, right? So these are the men I admire, right? I admire these kind of semi-flawed or very flawed men who are, working with everything they have to kind of outpace this one thing that they see as their fatal flaw. Right. And for some of them, it ends tragically. I mean, Hamilton uh, obviously dies in the spoiler. If you haven't seen the musical or read a history book in the last 20 years, 
Hamilton dies in a duel, um, partially because of his, his pride and partially because of, um, not being willing to kind of deal with that chip on his shoulder a little bit. Um, and I think that that's a temptation within myself as well, um, to feel like I have to play with this chip on my shoulder. Uh, and so I, I think it's worthwhile to look at our heroes and say, okay, where, where does this maybe not the healthiest or where, where maybe am I being drawn into something that I maybe should be more aware of? And, and for me, I think as I'm looking at my heroes, the thing that I admire about them is their willingness to create and their passion to create a lasting legacy for other people. Um, Hamilton's creating the national bank for his children. Roosevelt's bettering the country um, for his nation. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading about Steve Jobs. Uh, I don't know if he's a hero of mine, but he's he's fascinating to me. Um, and his passion for creating these beautiful objects for others. Um, and Aaron Sorkin, just like this this desire to create plays that are basically music, dialogue that's music. Um, and then my dad's pretty much at the top of the list of, of doing stuff for other people. Um, as a pastor, I, I think, uh, that's just his MO. So anyway, um, does that, does that make sense? Do, do you, how does that no, there, there's, disconnect? That makes sense. There's, a it's, it's the drive to become something more than these men were told that they are a little bit. Right. I'm I'm more familiar with Teddy Roosevelt out of that list a little bit. And it's just, just the, I mean, he was told by a doctor and he's a little like, you're never, you should stay indoors, be very careful. And so what did he do? Go outside and try running through the woods and boxing and stuff. You know, it's just like, yeah, yeah. He said no. And he had, uh, there's, I don't know. The word would be something like gumption or, or, uh, <laughs> let's pause or something. I don't know. Just, grit. just something. Yeah. Grit could be a, could be the word. One and, that I remembered. Louis Zamperini. Have you, you know, his story? Yes. Oh, wow. That, I mean, that another, yeah. I don't even know. That's just, that's just endurance resilience. That's the word. The yeah. word is resilience. It's, and maybe that's something I was talking about or trying to get to earlier a little bit is that, that self-assurance really is a, a resilience against the odds. Yeah. And, and for those who don't know, because Louis Zamperini may not be the most popular of, of heroes, um, Louis Zamperini was a uh, an athlete uh, right before World War II who was one of the fastest uh, track and field cross country athletes um, in the world. He was on his he was on his way to break the four minute mile um, right before World War II started, um, and uh, before he was able to compete to break that record, the, the war started. Uh, he went to fight in the Pacific Front. The Pacific Theater and was captured by the Japanese um, and, and endured just kind of incredibly brutal uh, it, torture and imprisonment there um, and managed to survive some of the most harrowing, uh, you, know, you want to talk about adventure. I mean, that's that's adventure uh, up, up, down and sideways. Um, but he managed to survive, to survive and actually uh, comes home and after a series of uh, misfortunes actually becomes a Christian uh, and travels all the way back to Japan to forgive uh, his his captors and his tormentors um, at the end of the story. It's just a, a really incredible it's, it's story. It's crazy. I mean, I don't know how you go through that. And then it's the resilience. Like, uh, yeah, some people have it. Yeah. And, and I think that's not. so I think one of these things that I, I wonder about here is, is how much of this is learnable, like how much of this is nature how much of this is nurture because i think roosevelt stands to me as this testament of you can you can beat what's given to you a little bit like right, you can right. take it and you can shape it but yeah how much do you do you have to be born with that desire that to be it or or can you learn that you know i i don't know i i'm thinking about people like my father or my my high school coach though and and going you know they didn't have that same or at least I, I have never seen them put in a situation where they just have to have that total resilient drive. You know, they're, they're in a prison of war camp or something. And thank God that they are not in that situation. Um, but they do have to, you know, beat the odds every day in terms of they're providing for families. 
And one thing you said earlier, just offhand, um, about your nieces, just, oh yeah, that's what we do for heroes. Like, you know, take kind of jokingly take a bullet yeah. for a hero at the same time, you know, a hero would do the same for you. It's, yeah. it's kind of a, it's maybe, maybe our heroes are a little bit of you die for them and they die for you. So it, we, you know, we venerate George Washington as the father of our country and he was fighting a war and the soldiers he was with loved him because he was there with them. It's one of the reasons Napoleon was so loved by the French. He, yeah. he would get, he would get down off his horse and get there with the common soldiers and be in the fray. And I, that's something like leaders that like that are loved. Yeah. Well, heroes sacrifice, right? Like that's, that's yes. part of what makes them a hero is they sacrifice either something about themselves for the common good, or, uh, you know, sometimes they sacrifice themselves. Um, and, and, you know, that's why I think you know, Christ is often referred to as like this archetype in narrative, um, in literature, because his, his heroic act um, appears again and again throughout, throughout all the stories we tell um, because he sacrifices himself for us. I mean, it's the, it's the Christ like narrative. Um, right. But I mean, you see that all over the place. And it's one of the things I love about Spider-Man is the, just the way that he will sacrifice himself for anyone to do the right thing. Even, you know, sometimes his own villains will be in, in danger, like to the point of that they're about to lose their life and he'll step right. in and save them. Um, and I just, that, that blows me away every time um, that commitment to heroics and to sacrificing so that no one dies. I think it's great. And, and by that definition, you know, you see someone like, like John Paul Jones again, he wouldn't quite fit the mold of a hero because he's more a win at all costs kind of guy. He was known for mm. one, or one of the reasons he, um, he's kind of a sketchy character early on in his career. He, he, over over punished several men for a mutiny like brutally beat them um and that was a that was a pattern in in his life where anyone anyone gets in the way and they're just going to be beaten to a pulp yeah um but what that meant was when he's fighting and there's an offer of surrender from a, another i think a british navy officer his reply was as his ship is being just completely obliterated. I have not yet begun to fight and he turns <laughs> it around and wins the battle. Like, this is the kind of thing where you just can't. Not everyone's a uh, hero. We, we, not everyone's a hero. And these traits that we sometimes see as heroic. I, I think we have to be careful sometimes. Yeah. That's all I'm saying is, is we have to be careful and, and figure out why are we allowing this individual to, occupy that that special space in our hearts where we were trying to be like them a little bit yeah no i i think even looking at like i was saying about steve jobs like uh, one one part of me wants to be like this guy's incredible i can't believe how much he created he was, and he was a jerk yeah he but he changed i mean the way that we look at the world now is 100 percent changed because of steve jobs even to the point right. of the way that like our computers work across the board, like the, the layering aspect of, of pages, you know, you can take a mm -hmm. tab and put one over the other. He, he yep. invented that basically. I mean, he was the one who pushed it across and that's just like a natural part of the way that we think about the world now. And, this, and right. it was revolutionary to the time. So he, he changes so much, but the way that he does that, his process in that is to just burn everything around him that is not in right. the service of himself. And I, I mean, I can't, I can't hold on to that because that's, it's just, right. I have to admire from a distance, but I, I can't say that that was a good thing, you know? Well, it's, it's, we need to take those qualities that are admirable. You know, the, the John Paul Jones, I have not yet begun to fight that gumption against the odds, that willingness to go for it, take that piece and, and leave a lot of the rest behind. And right. then we need, you know, it, it's, it's that fighting against the odds. Like we face that day by day, whether we realize it. Yeah. Yeah. The common danger of existence. Yes. I don't know. Kind of circling back around to the point you were making about Christ as a, as a hero and that sacrifice. I think that's, that's the thing in our lives where day by day we need to be looking at how, how are we doing that for, for those around us? 
Yeah, well, I mean, thinking about uh, what our what our call as as Christian men is, I mean, that's a big part of uh, what what we talk about here, and and one of the things that the, the Bible talks about is dying dying to self. It's particularly for for um, for men, you know, his call to husbands and wives. To husbands, he says, um, "Husbands, love your wives as as Christ loves the church." Uh, the implication there being. Uh, the way that Christ loved the church was not to boss the wife around or to, uh, you know, make every single decision. Uh, but it was instead to, to die on, on the church's behalf to die, uh, not just an easy death, but a horrible death, um, to make that sacrifice. Um, and I think if we're realistic about what we're called to as Christian men, we're called to die daily. I think we're, we're called to this, sacrifice um early and often um and i think if we're doing anything less than sacri- sacrificing ourselves and if we're asking someone else particularly uh our loved ones to sacrifice for us um and making that demand um then i i think we're we're missing the point uh, we're missing what we're we're called to do and and like we said like uh these these less than heroes uh, or these anti-heroes uh, like Steve Jobs are doing it because they're 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 brave in their own defense, but they're cowards when it comes to the thing that matters most. Um, right. right. And I think that's what we have to remember is that there is a higher standard, there is a higher morality that we're called to, um, and we're called to be as as Christ with the church. All right, on to uh, the discussion and introduction of the next challenge. Uh, we don't have, uh, we, we won't dedicate a lot of time uh, to this conversation uh, right now, but we've titled this Digital Natives in Exile. So that's kind of the, the theme um, for this. We're talking about technology because it's everywhere. So this, we, we've talked about it a little bit already with the, the Steve Jobs and um, what you were talking about with your students, Banjo. Um, but so the challenge, the challenge will be, um, again, they last for 10 days, simple, simple stuff. This is another honor journal challenge. And I think we're going to be doing this a lot where, uh, utilizing the journal as a baseline, uh, but switching up kind of the content. Um, so this, uh, this challenge is use the journal to kind of keep a, keep a log of your tech use. So like, like you might, a, uh, a, a food, like a diet or something like if you're tracking a food log or something. Uh, so just at the end of the day, every day record, all right, well, you know, what, how much time did you spend where be thinking about that? Um, and our phones, uh, or most phones, smartphones have little time trackers now anyway. And, I, and if you don't have that, there's apps for that on all the app stores. So you could download that and then, uh, you can do the same for laptops and stuff. And if it's, if you're using your, your, if you have to use a laptop or something for work, um, you might just be cognizant of, well, how much time maybe do you have to use it for work? Just to kind of see how much is it present in your life. Um, but part of the real point of the log is then to think about, are you happy with that time you spend? Is it, was it, was it, or maybe, maybe you're not happy with it because you don't like something about your work, but is it something that you're, you feel good about and, and you'd be you're not like, wow, I just spent an hour on social media today. I think I think the rule here is the I think this is the old Walt Whitman rule. This is uh, be curious, what? not judgmental. Yes, uh, yes. So so you know the the exercise the purpose of the exercise is not to you know condemn anyone for the amount of time that they're spending on the internet. Uh, again, the the honor general. How dare you <laughs> listen to anything other than this podcast and read anything other than our website? And, yeah. Obviously, we use technology place. and and we love it. Yeah. So we're not, there's caution. Yeah. We're not interested in, in saying, well, all technology is bad and evil and and whatnot. Um, but I think as, as the gap of, or, or, or as the world of the digital age continues to grow, we have to be thoughtful about what are we, what are we putting our time into and what does that look like? And, um, it's, it's things that I'm not always aware of. So one thing that I'm going to be keeping track of is, um, you know, how how much time am I spending on 
uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. How many times am I checking it? Because I have this sneaking suspicion that I, I check those places just instinctively, uh, that there's no real thought behind it. Um, and, and for me, this, this challenge is an exercise in taking every thought captive, um, which is, I think, something that we're called to do as Christians. Absolutely. Um, so uh, you use this as not like, uh, this is not a, a, a place for you to, to write everything down and say, oh, well, now I have right. to do 55 push-ups and 63 Hail Marys in order to output the, uh, the internet input. That's, that's not what this is for. This is just, let's be, let's be thinking, let's be careful about what we're doing. And, and you may be pleasantly surprised. You may find that you're um, spending just the amount of time that you want on the internet. Right. Um, but I think one thing that I talked about with, with some of the kids yesterday, and, and we can talk about this maybe more next week, but um, the, the design of computers, the design of cell phones is to keep you there. Uh, right, right. The, the intention of the, the way it's designed is, is to make you fall in love with it and to spend all of your time in it. Um, I, was, I was telling these fifth graders, I said, the, the beautiful thing about a book, the way it's designed is that it's meant to be put down. It's meant to be finished. It's meant to be closed um, because you're meant to get up and do something else, um, to go right. out and, and change something else. Um, so just be thinking about that with where you're spending your time. What's the design of the place? What is it trying to do uh, for or with your mind? So on, on that note, um, <clears throat> I've mentioned Tristan Harris to you before, Banjo. Uh, yeah. And a lot of folks have seen the documentary, The the Social Dilemma, I think was the one he put out. Um, and he he's a former, it's kind of a, f a fun title of, he was a product philosopher for Google, I think. And essentially he, he realized, yeah, these products Google is putting out are becoming more and more addictive instead of less and less addictive as I give them my research. That's not great. So he left and he started the uh, Center for Humane Technology. And um, they, they've got a podcast, which is worth listening to uh, at some point. They, they don't, I, I don't agree with everything they say, but they've got some um, great stuff about just the power of technology and about kind of it's almost slot machine like nature uh, sometimes. And and when we talk, like I'm talking about technology and specifically kind of the smartphone social media sense there. Um, because I, of course, technology is not necessarily like we use it. So there's uh, an author, um, John Dyer, he wrote from the garden to the city and he, he distinguishes between technology and tools because we've, for most of human history, technology has just, has just been our tools, right? And now we have this, this special rapidly designed piece of technology, which isn't just a tool. It's, it can be used for entertainment and fun and pleasure. And you're like, okay, that, that can start to go down a dark path really quickly if you're not too careful. And so, um, that's a book I'm going to be reviewing over the next couple of weeks and bring to our discussion the next episode. Another book that um, is would be worth reading uh, is The the TechWise Family by Andy Crouch. And now this one is, if you don't have a family, if you're, if you're a single guy, then um, not every piece of this book will be useful. But I would say go ahead and pick up a copy and, and read it because uh, it can impact a lot of your life if, if you put into practice a lot of what it has to say. Um, and there, there's very simple things, um, things like having a, a phone home in your house and things like having a, a tech Sabbath, stuff like that. Like the, they're not new ideas. It's just a consolidation of, of, of those ideas and a way to put them into, into practice. And then, um, of course I already mentioned the social dilemma, great documentary. Uh, and Tristan Harris has a whole website, lots of blog articles, lots of great information out there about him and his work that would be worth checking out. One other book, uh, if you're if you're not interested in any of the ones that JJ just mentioned, um, though I'm sure they're great and and I'm excited to pick them up myself uh, eventually and read through them. Uh, but if you want an older read, uh, then Neil Postman's "Amusing Ourselves to Death" yes um, yes is an incredible book about media ecology and the and the landscape that we uh, find ourselves in. It was written, help me out here, JJ. I think in the seventies. 
maybe yeah, seventies or eighties, seventies before or 80s. the smartphone anyway. Um, pre-internet age, uh, it was written about television, um, but the things that he has to say about um, the lines between education and entertainment and the difference between those, um, and, and just particularly the way that these different media devices trap trap us in their world um, is just really prescient and uh, a little bit prophetic uh, and, and very much worth the read. Also Fahrenheit 451. Just on a separate note, a brave new world, that. right? We could, we could, the list we could goes just on. go on. We could go yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, these, these are ideas that, like, we are not the first ones to talk about technology or the first ones to think about it. Um, just the, the point here. The the point here is, we want to put it into practice because I, I talk about this tech stuff all the time. I, I mean, I wrote, um, like my capstone project, in in college was on on the use of technology and our design of it and and yet i still find myself an hour into a youtube scroll and i'm going wait wait me i like i talk about this stuff all the time i think about it all the time i tell my friends about it all the time so this is i this This is is us getting more aware this is us getting the log out of our own eye yeah that that's that's what this is in a lot of ways so i (laughs) encourage you journal um, journal on this. Oh, and and one thing. So, Art of Manliness had a uh, they had an episode about journaling not too long ago, actually. Um, and one thing the guest on that suggested was uh, he, he calls it micro journaling. And what he does, or what he did, was he took his social media app, moved it from wherever it was on his phone because he found his thumb moving there automatically, and put a notes app where the social media app was. And so as he nice. instinctively clicked that, you know, then it opens up your notes app and you're like, okay, this isn't Instagram, Twitter, whatever. It, it, this is, this is my notes app. And then he would just write a quick sentence about how he felt about that or, you know, blog that he'd done that, something like that. Um, so it became this micro journaling and, you know, fragments of sentences just over the course of uh, months or, or years even, I think, piled up into a lot, all his thoughts on technology and how he was feeling and, I, that's I thought that clever. Was, that's a that was a good idea. I like uh, that and, and a way to implement that. I like it. Well, I think that uh, about wraps up our discussion, both discussions for the day. Um, I look forward to continuing this uh, discussion on technology in the next episode and learning what we've learned. Indeed. Well, this has been the Forging Honor Podcast. Music and production is by Elliot George. For more information about what we do or to learn how to get involved, visit our website at forginghonor.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to like, subscribe, and give us a rating to bring others into the Forging Honor journey. On our website, you'll find information on how to do the challenges alongside us, as well as links to the many resources we mentioned in the show. And we do make a small amount from any purchases you make through our website links, so thank you in advance. Thanks for taking time with us today. We hope you'll take up the work alongside us and join us in the task of forging honor. We'll see you next time.